Simple question, is molecular gastronomy actually good? Molecular gastronomy is a sub-discipline of cooking that looks to push the boundaries of what's considered food and how it's presented by radically altering the tastes and textures of the ingredients. This could be as simple as adding a non-traditional thickener to a dish to get a more interesting or appealing texture, or making a fillet out of a collection of different fish, or maybe even busting out the centrifuge to isolate a particular part of a liquid for use in later steps. Point is, things can get a bit weird, and while one of the draws of molecular gastronomy is that it makes food instantly more gram-worthy, how much of it actually tastes good? Like, are noodles made of agar actually good, or are they awful? What about tiny bursting spheres of juice? Well, there's only one way to find out. So today we're going to look at one specific molecular gastronomy technique and see if it's trash or treasure. And I hope to look at more techniques in the future. Specifically, we're looking at one ingredient called maltodextrin. The basic concept is pretty straightforward. Maltodextrin as a molecule has the ability to hold oils but then dissolve in water. It's a short chain of sugar molecules made by breaking down starch into smaller pieces. So the concept is you mix it with some sort of oil which makes the oil turn into a sort of powder, and as soon as you eat it, it releases the oil again once it mixes with the water in your saliva. In theory, this could be a really interesting textural change in a dish, but does it actually work, and is it worth the effort? Let's start by just mixing it with some different oily things and seeing what happens. First, we add some of our test oil to a bowl, and then start adding the maltodextrin and mixing. The trick is to add just enough maltodextrin that you get a powder, but not to go overboard and end up with something that just tastes like sugar. We're going to start with plain olive oil. As the maltodextrin is added, the oil begins to thicken, so you can see why maltodextrin has come to be used as a thickening agent for some applications, and mixes with the oil quite easily. As more is added, it thickens further until it's basically a paste. At this point, a little more is added, and if it's worked into the oil, it begins to crumble. To get a really light powder, the crumbly mixture can be forced through a fine mesh sieve to break it up into tiny sprinkleable bits. Before tasting, let's make a few more. Here I've got some Nutella and peanut butter. While these aren't as runny as pure olive oil, they are nonetheless quite oily thanks to the fats released by the nuts they're made of, so they mix quite easily with the maltodextrin. Unlike the olive oil though, they have a lot more flavor and body, so should hopefully bring a little bit more to the final powders. And then quickly, here's some sesame oil done the same way. Okay, let's give these a taste. First up, the olive oil. This one was frankly just really weird. At first you get the almost chalky sweet taste of the maltodextrin, but once it had a second to dissolve, you get a burst of olive oil flavor. And while it is interesting, it ends with your teeth just feeling sticky, and it's not a particularly pleasant experience. The sesame oil has the same problem, but frankly it's even worse. The flavor is so much punchier, but with the sweet maltodextrin, it's almost gag-inducing. Both the peanut butter and Nutella were winners. I'm not sure given the choice I'd go for the powder over the pure original stuff, but they are actually quite tasty, and the sweetness of the maltodextrin doesn't add an off flavor in the way that it did with the olive and sesame oil. I also found that these didn't have quite as much of that sticky teeth feel that the olive oil did. I think because the starting stuff was much thicker and had essentially tiny particles of ground up nuts in it, it helped prevent the same clumping and sticking. Okay, so now that we've got some powders to play with, let's see if they're better if they're actually used in something. First up, the only thing I could think of to use the olive oil powder in was bruschetta. This classic Italian appetizer is super simple to make and classically features olive oil as one of the key flavors. I picked up some sweet small tomatoes still on the vine, mozzarella bocconcini, and some fresh basil and garlic. I chopped the tomatoes and cheese roughly, no larger than one centimeter pieces. The garlic was finely diced, but grated with a microplane also works. I keep a collection of fresh herbs growing so I could pick some fresh basil right off the plant. Stack the leaves, and then roll them tightly, and then slice them as thin as physically possible. This is called a chiffonade, and the thin slivers of basil actually taste more strongly than if they were cut more coarsely. Now technically, bruschetta can be made using any sturdy rustic bread, but for whatever reason, a baguette is sort of classic. I always found this funny, as bruschetta is an Italian dish, yet most recipes call for French bread. To plate up, first slice a nice diagonal slice of bread so there's lots of surface to stack the toppings on. Then toast them. Here I'm just using my oven, but a toaster works just fine. We just want to add a bit of crunch, and crisping up the bread helps prevent it getting soggy. To make standard, normal bruschetta, I'd start with a sprinkle of minced garlic and a bit of olive oil, and then top with the tomatoes, cheese, and basil, and a little bit of kosher salt. And for an added bit of kick, a little bit of balsamic vinegar. But we're here to do molecular gastronomy, so let's go ahead and ruin one by omitting the olive oil and finish with the olive oil powder instead. And the end result? Well, the classic version is delicious, but the olive oil powder drops it to a disappointing 5 out of 10. 
You still get that delicious bruschetta flavor, but then your teeth get sticky and there's no detectable olive oil taste. But since I was messing around with bruschetta anyway, a much more fun way of elevating this dish with molecular gastronomy is rather than messing with the olive oil, play with the balsamic vinegar instead. Here I'm making some balsamic vinegar caviar using a process called spherification, which I'll cover in a future video. It turns the balsamic into the little fluid-filled balls that pop when you bite them, and these are actually a lot of fun and quite tasty. Not only does this add a fun visual accent in a way that the olive oil powder just doesn't, it actually tastes good and adds to the dish rather than detracts from it. So as a preview for a future molecular gastronomy video, spherification really is awesome. Okay, moving on, let's try and make these powders shine, so let's work with the Nutella and peanut butter, as those were great as a baseline. One nice part of these powders is that you can directly mix spice powders into them to tweak the flavor in ways that would be much more difficult with the source materials. So for the peanut butter, I added a small sprinkle of powdered ginger. The combination of ginger and peanut butter is delicious, so the powder on its own now is actually quite fun. To put these to use, I thought I'd have to make a dessert, since they're so sweet and tend to lend themselves well to this. So I'm going to be making a banana brulee and top the banana with each of the powders. First, a banana is sliced into nice flat strips and then put on a little plate. Sprinkle enough sugar on top of each slice to make sure that they're covered. You don't want to be stingy here, this works well with a reasonable amount of sugar. Then, using a brulee torch, slowly work back and forth over the slice of banana until the sugar melts and then begins to caramelize. Take your time and don't stay in one area for too long or you will burn it. But when you've done this, it adds a sweet, crunchy caramel top to the bananas, which I just love. Repeat with the second slice, and then we can plate up. All I did was just sprinkle a generous amount of each of the powders, one per slice, onto the bananas. And that's it. Super fast dessert that looks fantastic and is ready in less than five minutes. But how does it taste, though? In a word, fantastic. Forget the clean plate club, this will have you licking the plate and asking for seconds. The crunchy brulee goes well with the banana, and the roasting process cooks the banana a little bit. And combined with the powders, it brings everything together into a delicious mix of fun flavor and texture. And honestly, you can tinker with this to improve it even more. Maybe try mixing other spices into the powders, or try other nut butters as a base. Or maybe add a bright fruit coulis or jelly as a contrasting accent. And it's so easy to do that if you're looking for something quick to wow your friends or significant other, I'd highly recommend it. And the powders themselves could be used to top a variety of other desserts, so in that regard, this could be quite cool. So, what's the verdict? Is maltodextrin worth it? I mean, as an ingredient for making interesting desserts? Sure, why not? But the savory powders just don't work. As I mentioned, maltodextrin, rather than making these powders, can be used as a thickening agent. But again, I think the sweetness it imparts into whatever you add it to makes this usually a poor choice. I can't really see myself reaching for maltodextrin very often unless it's a component of a more complex dessert. So if I had to give it a score out of 10, I'd say a very reasonable 7. It's got some niche uses where it shines, but it's not something I would call an essential kitchen addition that could do much for your cooking unless you make a lot of desserts. But that's where I think I'll leave it for now. This is the first episode of the Taste Emporium, so if you've enjoyed, be sure to smash that like button and subscribe. These videos and videos on my main channel are supported thanks to my amazing patrons, so if you enjoyed and want to keep the flow of recipes coming, there's some links below. If you haven't already, head over to Instagram where I post these recipes and others that I'm testing long before they end up in videos. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.